Hi, I'm Gidon from TechnologyMan.com. The Ruko F11 GIM2 drone has a 4K camera with two axis gimbal stabilization and electronic image stabilization, up to three kilometers of range, brushless motors, automated flight modes, and it comes with a controller, two batteries for up to a total of 56 minutes of flight time and a hard case. I'll see how easy it is to get started and I'll test out all its features to help you decide if this might be your perfect first drone. So let's take a closer look. The drone comes well packaged in a smart and useful branded hard case with a carry handle. Inside this case, you get the drone itself with the battery already installed, the controller, a spare battery, two USB-A to USB-C charging cables, one set of spare blades with spare screws to attach them and the user guides. There's a safety guide, quick start guide and a thorough 40 page complete user manual, all in English. I'd recommend reading through these manuals before your first flight, even if you have previous experience with drones like this. There's lots of useful information. Both batteries arrive with around 50% charge, so you'll need to charge them completely before your first flight. There's no charger included, but any 5 volt, 2 amp, portable or wall charger will do. For any RC enthusiasts, these are 3 cell 11.1 volt 3S LiPo batteries with 2,500 milliamp hour capacity, but you're limited to charging them very slowly with the included USB cable via their integrated USB-C port at around 0.5 amps which will take approximately four hours for a full charge. There are two batteries and Ruko quotes 28 minutes flying time for each battery. So as long as you're prepared, you should still have plenty of flight time. You also need to charge the controller, which also has a USB-C port. The display will show the battery level as a percentage. The camera gimbal has a protective cover you'll need to remember to remove. It's latched at the bottom and you need to remove it carefully to avoid any damage to the fragile looking gimbal. Then unfold the front arms the rear arms and the propellers. Unfold the controller, extend the antennas and place your phone in the bracket. The bracket should be able to fit even larger phones extending up to nine centimeters. The build quality of the drone and the controller is pretty good for the price of the drone. The drone weighs 566 grams with a battery installed, which weighs 200 grams itself. The controller weighs 279 grams and has an integrated 1500 milliamp hour battery. You can see the dimensions of the drone folded and unfolded on screen. There's no micro SD card supplied with the drone, but the integrated micro SD slot can take up to a 128 gigabyte card. I'm using a 64 gigabyte SanDisk Extreme card. A long press of the power button on top of the battery turns the drone on with a confirmation beep. Four LEDs light up to show the battery level. This works on the battery when it's not attached to the drone too, but you shouldn't turn the battery on before inserting it into the drone. Then turn on the controller with the power button. The first press shows the battery remaining and the second press turns it on. The controller and drone will automatically link with each other, which takes up to 40 seconds. And the display on the controller will switch from connecting to Cal Compass. To calibrate the compass, first rotate the drone horizontally one to two turns, then vertically with the camera pointing upwards. You'll get a confirmation beep when this is completed and the front and rear LEDs will stop flashing purple. You have to do this every time you turn the drone on. Then place the drone on the ground and you can calibrate the gyroscope by pushing the joysticks to the 11 and one o'clock positions. The LEDs will flash white and blue quickly. If you keep an eye on the gimbal, it should also level itself. The LEDs will now flash blue and white a little more slowly while the drone waits for a GPS lock. Once the lock has been achieved, GPS will stop flashing on the controller and the LEDs on the drone will also stop flashing. Check the GPS signal strength on the controller. You need three bars before you can start the motors. Unfortunately, you can't see the number of satellites you're connected to, which I'd find more reassuring considering how important a good GPS signal is for a drone like this. You don't have to use your smartphone to fly the drone, but you'll get lots more information on your drone and its flight, access to all the automated flight modes, and most importantly, the live video feed from the drone's camera. Connect to the drone's Wi-Fi in your Wi-Fi settings, starting with Ruko GIM2. Then open the Ruko app and grant any permissions. There are some useful help videos and guides within the app which you should take a look at. Then tap on controls and you should see a live feed from the drone's camera. If you're away from your home's Wi-Fi, the drone should automatically connect to the Ruko's Wi-Fi every time you turn it on. Otherwise, you'll have to manually switch across to the Ruko. To start up the drone's brushless motors, push the left and right joysticks down and inwards to the five and seven o'clock positions. If this doesn't work, you probably don't have a decent GPS signal. Check for three bars. In the app, you can tap on the auto takeoff icon or you can just push up on the left joystick. The left joystick moves the drone up and down and rotates it left and right. 
the right joystick moves the drone forward and backwards and right and left. To land the drone, you can tap on the auto takeoff icon, which will have changed to auto land. The drone will land and the motors should shut off. If they don't, you can pull the left and right joystick downwards and to the left as before, this time to shut off the motors. You can also tap on the GPS return to home function, which will automatically fly the drone back to its takeoff location and land it for you. I'll cover this feature shortly. Finally, you can just pull down on the left joystick to land the drone manually. The drone uses the built-in altitude sensor to assist landing and shut off the motors, but no optical flow positioning for indoor flights like Ruko's U11 Pro. By default, the drone is in beginner mode, so it's limited to 30 meter distance away from you and 30 meters height. You won't be able to fly beyond this range and you'll get a warning if you try. To extend this range, tap on the three dots at the top right of the screen and disable beginner mode. Then adjust the sliders based on where you're flying and your local rules and regulations. Under track, there's a record of your flights and a useful find drone which will show your drone's last GPS flight position if you manage to lose your drone. By default, the screen on your phone shows a live video feed from your drone's camera. In the bottom left of the display, there's a compass. If you tap on this once, it shows the drone's location on a map. And if you tap on it again, it shows a full screen view of the map with the live view shrunk down to the corner. Tapping this again brings a live image full screen again. If you want your compass view back, you can tap on the small location icon in the top right of the small map or live view. If you've installed a micro SD card, tap on the SD card icon to format the card. You can toggle between photo and video mode and tap the record icon to start recording. There are no recording options. The camera will record 4K photos and videos to the SD card. At the same time, it records 4K photos to your phone for only 720p videos. The videos are 30 frames per second. I'd really like a 25 frames per second option for PAL regions like the UK. You don't have to have an SD card installed. You can still record photos and videos, you just won't be able to access the full capabilities of the 4K camera in video mode. If you tap on the playback icon, you can see your photos and videos captured directly to your phone. On an iPhone, these are also stored in your camera roll. To access photos and videos off the SD card, tap on the SD card icon. If you tap on a video, you can download the full quality video to your phone. If you have a lot of content, it'll be quicker to remove the card from the drone and use a micro SD card reader. If you tap on the microphone icon, you can capture audio with your videos. The drone doesn't have its own microphone, this just uses your phone's microphone. Also, the higher quality videos on the SD card won't have audio, only the lower quality videos captured on your phone. There's a fair bit of lag, so don't try and use it where you want lip sync, but it's still a useful feature. The bottom of the screen shows the distance and altitude in meters and the speed in meters per second. You can change the units in settings to kilometers per hour or miles per hour. And at the top of the screen, you can see the battery level of the controller, the GPS signal strength, and the battery level of the drone. The controller and drone show a battery gauge and the voltage of their respective batteries. 4.2 volts maximum for the single 3.7 volt LiPo battery in the controller, and 12.6 volts for the three cell 11.1 volt LiPo battery in the drone. Have a look at my video on the budget WL Toys RC car. For more information on these LiPo batteries used with RC cars and drones. The joystick icon reveals additional functions. I'll cover the flight modes shortly, but you can create music videos with a few supplied tracks. Again, you won't get the music with the SD card high resolution videos. There's a VR mode if you want to use a basic VR headset to fly your drone. Lens angle lets you control the angle of the gimbal and filter applies a selection of filters. These filters won't be applied to the SD card videos, so you could play around with these and you'll still have access to the original videos. There's also a five times digital zoom, but this only applies to your live feed, not your phone or SD card recordings. It's still useful for looking more closely at a feature in a landscape whilst you're flying, but it does get pretty blurry quickly. The controller mimics a few features of the app, but also has a few extra features. Most notably, the speed button changes the speed of the drone from its default normal mode to speed mode to the slowest camera mode, which ensures you don't get the propellers in your footage and should result in smoother motion. If you press and hold this button, you turn off GPS mode and enter what Ruko calls attitude mode. If you can't get to GPS lock and still want to take off, you can enter this mode. But you'll lose your return to home function and the drone will require more skill to fly. So for most people, I wouldn't recommend it. The stop button shuts off the drone's motors immediately mid-flight, which might be useful if you're going to hit something to prevent additional damage. You need to press it once, then again for three seconds, so you shouldn't be able to accidentally enable it. To power off the controller, you press the power button once and then again holding it down. There's also a dedicated return to home button 
and around the front dedicated buttons for recording photos and videos. Below the photo button on the left is a jog dial to zoom in digitally up to five times. It directly mimics the app zoom function so you can still only see this in live view, not your recordings. The right jog dial adjusts the gimbal angle like in the app, but it's far more convenient using this dial. By default the gimbal looks straight ahead, but you can adjust it to point almost directly downwards around 80 degrees. There's a small delay between activating this dial and the gimbal responding, but it moves smoothly if you keep hold of the dial. The controller display shows most of the same information as the app, but you also see the remote control signal strength, the speed mode and a larger display of the drone's battery level. It's not possible to fly the drone without the controller. The drone has a number of automated flight modes. The one you'll probably use most often is return to home that I've already briefly mentioned. You need to have GPS mode turned on so the drone can remember its takeoff location. It will then bring the drone back to this location when return to home is activated in one of three ways. You can tap on this mode manually as I've already covered. The drone will ascend to the return altitude set in settings to avoid any obstacles, then travel home and land. I found it landed usually within a meter or so of its takeoff. If the drone is less than 30 meters away, it just flies straight back without traveling to its return altitude first. You can cancel this mode if you press the return to home button again. Return to home will be automatically activated if the drone battery is low, around 11 volts as displayed on the battery gauge in the app. You'll get a voice prompt and the drone will fly home. You can't cancel this operation, you can use the right joystick to adjust the landing position. I tested this a few times and it worked as it should. Down. The drone will also return to home if it loses signal to the controller. In my test I never lost signal so I couldn't test this feature. But if it approaches home and manages to regain its link to the controller, the return to home operation will be cancelled. I'd recommend setting your return altitude based on your surroundings. You don't want it having to ascend to its maximum 120 meters if the battery is low, if it doesn't need to. Where I fly 50 to 80 meters is plenty. In the waypoint flight mode, you can set a predefined route under route rules. Tap on the map to create up to 16 waypoints to define a route and then tap on go. The drone will travel to waypoint one and then follow the route from there. It would be good if you could choose where the camera was directed while the drone flies between waypoints and I prefer to have the option to draw the route for a smoother flight. But the feature worked very well. Push the right joystick up to cancel the flight. The point of interest mode flies the drone around an object. First hover the drone directly above the object you're interested in. Then press both the photo and video buttons together to set this position. Use the right direction joystick to set the radius of your circle up to 100 meters away and press the two buttons together again to start the drone's flight. This works pretty well but I'd also like a way to execute it from the app when you forget how to set it up. You can use the left joystick to adjust the drone's altitude but using the right joystick will exit the mode so you can't change the radius of the flight. There are two follow me modes, a GPS mode that follows the GPS location of your phone and a tracking mode that can automatically track an object or person using image recognition. The GPS mode would be useful if you wanted to record yourself mountain biking or running for example. It won't lose track of you if you go out of sight of the drone. Although without any obstacle avoidance sensors, its uses may be a little limited. I've tried this a few times and usually get a message that the GPS phone signal is too weak. Give it around a minute and try again and it should work. It then works pretty well, although I couldn't get it to keep me in the middle of the frame despite making adjustments mid-flight. If you tap the image tracking follow me mode, you can draw a box around the object you want to track and the drone will attempt to keep the object in frame by rotating itself. So it stays in the same location unlike the GPS follow me mode. I did deliberately try and confuse it by running underneath. It tracked me to the edge of the frame and then started spinning frantically. I had to tap again on the icon to exit the mode. But the actual image tracking also works well. And for example, you could use this mode for tracking a player on a football pitch. There are also two gesture modes to either capture a photo with a V sign or a video with your hand. I couldn't really get this to work, perhaps it was too sunny when I tried it, but with dedicated buttons on the controller, I can't really see a need for it. I tested the drone in various conditions and it couldn't be any easier to fly. I didn't fly it in very windy conditions, but I still felt confident controlling it in a stiff breeze, which is one advantage of a slightly heavier drone like this. If you let it hover without touching the controls, it's not completely steady, but it's a lot better than I was expecting. In the default normal flying mode, it feels fast enough for a camera drone. Jumping from this 9 meters per second speed to the sports mode 12 meters per second, there's not a huge difference, but it is noticeable. You're more likely to get the propellers in the frame though. If you drop to the camera modes sedentary 4.5 meters per second, you'll get the smoothest footage. But I left it in normal mode most of the time. 
The drone responds quickly to the flight controls and has a lot of fun to fly. One of the main reasons for getting a drone like this is the camera. With its two axis gimbal and the electronic image stabilization, the footage looks very smooth. The lower resolution 720p files recorded straight to your phone's camera roll will often be good enough to share on social media. And you can easily download the full resolution 4K file if you need better quality. If you look closely at the 4K files, there is a fair bit of image noise even in good light. With quite heavy image compression and the automatic white balance can be a little off sometimes. But I think most users would be pretty happy with the image quality overall, as you can hopefully see from the sample videos. Ruko claims the drone has a range of almost 3 kilometers, which is very impressive. Another advantage of a slightly larger drone like this is it's easier to see further away. On a clear day, I could just about spot it 130 meters from me. So I can't confirm whether it can achieve even close to its maximum range under our local flight restrictions in the UK, where the drone has to be visible at all times. But in all my test flights, I never lost communication between the controller and the drone. And the live video feed to my phone worked very well. In this flight, I got 25 minutes of flight time before I got the audible battery warning, which triggered the return to home. By the time I'd landed the drone, I'd had around 26 minutes of total flight time, a little under the quoted 28 minutes. This is pretty close and will vary depending on how you fly the drone and wind conditions. The drone's brushless motors help it achieve its respectable battery life, and although it's still quite noisy, if you're near to it, I've heard far louder drones. The Ruko F11 GIM2 is a great option for anyone new to drones. The instruction manual and helpful video guides will very quickly get you started and it's incredibly easy to fly. The camera does capture very smooth footage, even if the conditions aren't perfect, thanks to the two axis gimbal and EIS. And the image quality is pretty good if there's plenty of light. I would like a 25 frames per second frame rate option though, and a few shooting modes would be nice, like HDR, time lapse, and a slow motion mode. If not 4K 50 frames per second, at least 1080p 50 or 100 frames per second. Battery life was better than I was expecting, and having a spare battery is very useful. Although I really would have liked faster charging. Ideally, I'd want to be able to charge a spare battery while I'm flying with the other battery. I only had one fairly gentle crash flying straight into a hedge, but the drone escaped with no damage, which is encouraging. You can buy spare arms, propellers, batteries, and a new controller directly from Ruko. I checked with Ruko, and they informed me parts shipped from their warehouses in the US, UK, and Germany in three to five days. I did find a few parts available on Amazon but I've not had a chance yet to put this to the test. And you'd have to contact Ruko support for other parts. The main competition to this drone would be the almost identical SJRC F11S 4K Pro, available directly from China from AliExpress. This is produced in the same factory as the Ruko. Shipping to the UK, you'd have to add VAT at 20% and local courier charges, so the model with two batteries and a hard case would work out at around 270 pounds, which is at least 100 pounds cheaper than the best price I've seen the Ruko for all based on prices at the time of making this video. But currently, you'll have to wait around eight weeks for shipping from China, and I'm not sure what support you'll get from SJRC. If you're okay with a smaller drone, the DJI Mini 2 can also be found for around the same price as this drone. None of these drones have obstacle avoidance, you'd have to step up to something like the more expensive DJI Mini 3 or Mavic Air 2 for that. The Mini 2 and 3 do have fewer flight restrictions though, being under 250 grams. I just want to briefly mention rules for flying a drone like the F11. This only applies to the UK, I'm not familiar with the rules in other countries, so you'd need to check. You need an operator ID to fly any camera drone in the UK, which isn't classed as a toy, which includes a DJI Mini 2. This costs £10 per year. Since the Ruko F11 is over 249 grams, you also need a flyer ID, which is free and lasts five years. But it does involve passing a basic online multiple choice test. I'll provide a link below to the CAA website where you can apply for both IDs. It's pretty straightforward. Even with an operator ID and flyer ID, you're quite restricted where you can fly a drone in this weight category. But these restrictions are eased considerably under what's called Article 16 Operational Authorization. For any drone over 250 grams, like the Ruko, I'd recommend joining either FPV UK or the BMFA. This will then cover you under Article 16, but it does cost another £20 per year for FPV UK and double that for the BMFA. I'll provide a link to more information down below. Also, if you're not sure where you can fly, look for a local flying club. They'll usually let you fly drones and offer some great locations to get started. If you've got any questions on the drone, please feel free to ask down below in the comments. I read every comment and will do my best to respond. I do hope you found this video useful. Please like the video if you did. I'm releasing videos every week on the latest technology and how to get the most out of it, so please make sure you subscribe. And don't forget to tap the bell icon if you want to get notified as soon as a new video gets uploaded. Thanks for watching.